So welcome to the webinar. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Productive OpenCL Programming and Introduction to OpenCL Libraries. I'm not sure if the audio is working on that last intro, so let me just go over a couple of items before we get started. You will find the GoToWebinar control panel in the upper right corner of your screen. You're probably listening to my voice through your computer speakers, but if you'd rather use the phone, you can navigate to the audio pane in the control panel and select the telephone radio button and the dial-in information will be displayed. You can also submit questions using the questions pane of the control panel. Feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar and we will address those during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. Our presenter, Odid Green, is the ArrayFire COO and a software developer. He received his PhD in Computational Science and Engineering from Georgia Tech and his work has focused on optimizing and designing algorithms for high-performance computing systems. Joining ODID today are his colleagues Umar, a senior software developer and engineer at ArrayFire, Pavan, also a senior software developer and engineer, and Scott, our v uh, the VP of Business Development at ArrayFire. So welcome, and now I'll, th I'll turn things over to ODID to get us started. Hey, Didi, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm glad to be here, and I'm, I'm very thankful that you all could join us. So um, let me start off by telling you a bit about um, ArrayFire. Um, we've been around since uh, 2007, and the, the company was founded by uh, Georgia Tech uh, researchers. And really, the, the focus of our company is to make code faster. We make things go fast. And um, we have a large number of customers that we've been able to help them with um, uh, accelerating their code. Just a small list of them are over here um, uh, in this slide. Google, Raytheon, Sandia, uh, NIH, um, Boeing. And so we really work with a lot of these uh, big companies to, to accelerate their code. Now, um, I'll be talking today about ArrayFire, the software package developed by ArrayFire, the company. And so really what we've done is we've um, developed an, um, an acceleration library that is really useful for uh, computational science and engineering, but also we believe is useful for additional application domains such as finances, um, uh, sorting databases type operations, and a lot more stuff. Um, we're also starting to focus on mobile computing because we believe that, we, um, that you can also get fast software on your, um, on, on your mobile devices. Now, in today's slide, most uh, in today's presentation, most of the slides that I'll show you that have uh, animations in them or uh, figures and graphs were actually uh, created using our uh, Rayfire software package. So these are all in-house uh, images that we've created, and typically, they're, um, most of these images are created using a very small number of codes, uh, lines of code. So really, you can think of it almost um, uh, script language. Um, you're almost writing a script script in C and getting that code as fast as and getting it really fast. And so, wh why do we think um, libraries are useful? Or GPU libraries are useful. Well, writing a, a, a GPU kernel is not an easy thing to do, and um, it really requires expertise. And we believe that libraries, um, a lot of the times, are going to be implemented by GPU experts, and they'll be. That means that you're going to get really fast code. And really, if the library was designed properly, you're going to have a very simple um, API to get access to it, which means that you're, it's going to be an ease of use. And that will make everything, all your software development that much easier versus actually having to write the kernel yourself or going to um, uh, SIMD level and doing um, the programming yourself. It's going to just really hurt your productivity. And that's where we really feel that um, uh, ArrayFire is a useful uh, library because it just eliminates a lot of hidden costs. You don't have to develop the software package. You don't have to do any testing in QA. You, you're not responsible responsible for documentation, maintenance, and porting. And so once you actually use the, the software package, package or library, it eliminates a lot of hidden costs in the software development and lets you focus on what you really care about, which is going to be your application. And so in today's talk, I'm going to focus on what we think are the two main kinds of GPU libraries. One's going to be um, a, what we call the specialized GPU library, and the other is going to be the general GPU library. Now, the specialized GPU library, um, the way we see it are these very specific libraries that um, help you 
with a very specific set of operators or functions. Um, and, and so they're not very broad. Um, they, or they might be optimized for a very specific system, meaning they will they'll work great on one system, but they're not going to be so great for another system. Also, um, the way we see it is that they, ha they have the C-like interface, meaning they're very, um, um, they're not very generic, and I'll talk a bit more about that when we talk about the general um, uh, GPU libraries, and they have this raw pointer interface. Whereas the general GPU uh, libraries, they do a lot of things for you. They, um, they manage the GPU resources for you so you don't have to worry about copying information between your host, which is going to be your CPU, and the device, which is going to be your GPU. So they do a lot of the um, memory allocation and deallocating and copying for you, so it simplifies your code. Um, the, the general GPU libraries are also uh, applicable to a larger set of applications. And um, they're not just going to focus on one uh, type of application. And the, uh, the way we see it is also they're going to be portable across multiple architectures. Now, that means you're going to have a higher level of functionality, um, it's sort of a C++-like C++ interface where you have templates where you write your code once for, uh, for a templated library, but you can compile it for any type of uh, data type that you have, which, uh, again, gives you more uh, generality and allows you to write once and um, apply many times. Now, uh, a, a subset of the specialized GPU libraries are going to be the fast Fourier transform called CLFFT. There's going to be the ran a random number generation uh, called random one, two, three. If you need to do linear um, algebra, you have CL, BLOSS, and MAGMA. Uh, for signal and image processing, you have OpenCL, IPP. Um, so let me go ahead, oh, just a quick reminder, um, these specialized libraries have um, um, a C-like interface. The responsibility, really, this is the big thing. You, the programmer is responsible for memory management. And that means he's respon responsible for allocating memory on the device, deallocating that memory, copying that memory. It becomes a bit of a hassle. Um, and that's really where we think that the generalized um, libraries are, are a bit better off. Now. What these libraries do, um, these GPU libraries do, they mimic um, existing libraries. So CL BLOSS is sort of the extension of the CPU version of BLOSS. MAGMA is a CPU extension of BLOSS and uh, LAPAC. Uh, CLFFT is the equivalent of FFTW. And why is this important? Well, if you've already written a CPU code that uses one of these libraries, it's going to really simplify your, um, it's going to simplify your integrating a GPU into your software or into your um, design because it's not going to be that hard to um, um, to access these GPU libraries. Um, but again, really important, uh, even if you do use these libraries, you're responsible for setting up the GPU and all the initial um, parameters. So that's part of the specialized GPU libraries. Now I'm just going to go quickly over, a, uh, over these libraries in a bit more detail. So CLFFT uh, allows you to do uh, fast Fourier transforms, either 1D, 2D, or 3D transforms. It has both a CPU and, and GPU backend, meaning you can run on either of these um, architectures. Um, it supports uh, a large, uh, large number of uh, data types, real and complex, single and double, pre double precision, and it also is going to allow you to do um, multiple transforms concurrently. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, this is a library that's maintained by AMD. Uh, random123 is a random number generator that was uh, created by D.E. Shaw. And um, it's a counter-based random uh, number generator. It's passed um, a, a large number of tests, including small crush, crush, and big crush, um, that checks um, the reliability of the uh, random number generator. It has four different random number generators uh, um, as part of it. Uh, 3, 4, 5, Philox, AS, and I, ARS. It is not uh, suitable for, for cryptography. Uh, then you have Magma and CLBLOSS, which are um, libraries used for uh, linear algebra. And Magma was developed by the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, and CLBLOSS is maintained by AMD. Now again, you have hundreds of random, uh, sorry, not random, hundreds of widely used linear algebra routines. And these libraries support uh, real and complex data types, single and double precision, 
and really useful when you need to do linear algebra. OpenCL IPP is um, an, a library package used for image processing and um, um, it's similar to Intel's IPP for those of you familiar with that. Um, as a software package, it supports many different types of image, um, um, image types, bitmap, JPEG and such, and has a large number of uh, primitives, whether they be arithmetic and logical, lookup tables, um, morphologies, transforms, image resizing, histograms, and much more. They have two different types of interfaces, a C interface and a C++ interface. And that's going to move us to our the second part of today's talk, which is going to be the uh, general purpose GPU libraries. And uh, we have a, a three libraries we're going to talk about, Bolt, OpenCV, and ArrayFire. But I have this picture over here of a multi-tool. Um, um, and the reason that we put this up is we really believe that these libraries are more multi-tools than the other, which are sort of um, uh, very fixed type of tools. You can use these software packages for developing a larger variety of, um, of software packages. So I'll start off with Bolt. Bolt is um, a GPU library which sort of resembles the C++ STL software package. Uh, again, it's going to have those same types of the STL data structures, iterators, um, and it, it's also fully interoperable with OpenCL. You have a large number of parallel vector operations such as reduction, sorting, parallel prefixing. Um, um, these are really um, useful um, in day-to-day -day operations that you're going to need. Um, you have a customizable GPU kernel that allows you to use functors. And um, it's worth noting that some functions are uh, only supported on AMD GPUs. You're not going to be able to use them on other types of hardware. Um, the data structure in Bolt are built around the, a, um, a data structure that they've called the device vector. It's sort of their keyword for, um, for creating um, uh, data types. And uh, there's a small example here with, um, in which you can um, create an array with two million elements using um, device template, uh, uh, triangle parentheses float, and uh, another keyword. You basically create an element, uh, an array of um, two million elements. And you can do this for any type of C++ data type that you want, whether it be in, float, in64, double. So it's really um, uh, robust. Um, and th the other thing is you can use Bolt to pass um, information onto STL algorithm, which allows you interoperability. The key thing to note is, because a lot of things are going to be happening on the GPU, you're going to be passing information from the GPU to the CPU, and that data transfer can be really costly. Um, again, um, Bolt uses a C++ STL-like um, um, interface. It, it, you can um, use functors, which allows you to customize your kernels. Uh, it has multiple black backends, such as OpenCL, C++ AMP, and Intel's TBB. Uh, not every algorithm is going to be implemented across all the backends. So really, if you need a specific algorithm, you might have to install a specific backend. OpenCV is an open source um, computer vision library, and that's the CV of OpenCV, is computer vision. It has uh, um, hundreds of computer vision uh, functions that people use um, um, for whatever type of computer vision application that they may need. Now it has a C++ interface, but it has many different types of language wrappers. So depending on what, what platform you're developing, you could find a, um, a language wrapper and use that for your um, um, development. ArrayFire uh, supports OpenCV and it's interoperable. If you want to take a look at it, you can um, look up um, our GitHub um, repository. We have um, some examples of how to use ArrayFire with OpenCV. And that actually is going to lead us to um, talking about ArrayFire library. And we built ArrayFire around this um, flexible data structure we called an array. And um, the reason that we see it is a lot of, to get really good performance on the GPU, you have to have a lot of data or data parallelism. And we saw that that, that would be a good use of an array. And so, just about all the operations we do on the GPU are done on an array. So even if you have a single piece of element that you need or a uh, scalar, 
you can just create an array of size one and do that operation. Nonetheless, really on the GPU, you want to have a lot of data parallelism. And so we've created wrappers around this array type structure that will simplify programming anything you need on the GPU. And essentially, when you actually create, you can, with very few lines of code, you can create an array on the GPU and um, the uh, array fire package will be responsible for allocating the memory, copying the memory to the GPU, and when you're done, to deallocating the memory. Now, in this example over here, I'm, I'm creating an array of size six elements on the host. And then I use the array structure, uh, which is our um, data structure, and I just copy that uh, host uh, array using a constructor, and I, do, and I allocate it on the GPU. Um, I do want to note that um, the arrays um, in our library are using column major um, order. So if you take a look over here, uh, um, here in the left we have the code, on the right we have the array that was created using uh, these two lines of code. Now while this may seem like a toy example for you, but you think about it in terms of you had a matrix of size 1,000 by 1,000 on, on, on your host, copying that data to the GPU is, is the same number of code, lines of code. It's going to be that simple. Um, Again, I'm going to show you some examples now on the on the of how to use array fire. Again, we create this um, array with uh, eight floating points in this example over here. Uh, this is on the host. We then copy it to the GPU, and in this example, we just want to sum up the um, values over the second column. So uh, we can we have a lot of functionality for array fire or for array, and that allows us to basically within one line of code sum up a single column. Then we can print out that value of that that we wanted to the screen, in which case the second column is going to be the sum of 4 plus 8, and the output is going to be 12. Um, now we want to do maybe some uh, more advanced functionality. In this case, I have a, um, an RGB image, which is going to be this image down here on the left, um, which is made up of three arrays, um, R, G, and D. And what I want to do is I want to swap the R channel with the um, D ch channel. And in this slide, I'm, I have three examples of how you can uh, swap those channels. And so really, it's, all of these three ways are simple and allow you to really, do, uh, to really uh, swap the uh, channels easily. The first example says, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save the R uh, array in a separate, in a temporary matrix. I'm going to copy B over the previous value of R, and then I can copy into B the value that I maintained in the temporary array, and then the output is going to be this um, the second image here on the right. But it's really, again, it's really sort of simple to do that, and it's also really simple to output the, um, the images onto the screen. Um, in this example over here, um, we just show you how easy it is to load an image into onto the GPU. So in this case, you just want to load the image image.jpg, and you say I want to load it in a grayscale fashion. So even if it's a, an RGB image, we load it as a grayscale, and we load it directly to the GPU. So you basically can read off your disk an image directly onto the GPU as far as you, the programmer, is concerned. After we uh, read the input to the GPU, we do an image transpose, and then we output it um, on this image here on the right. So again, within two operations, I've loaded a, uh, um, um, my image to the GPU, and I've been able to transpose it. Now, a couple more examples we're going to see right now um, are the, the additional functionalities that we have. So I have in this image, I have these, um, these balls that are uh, in multiple colors. And um, for each one of these next upcoming images, I'm going to show you that you can do a lot of these um, images um, sorry, um, you're going to be do, able to use a lot of functionality um, with a, basically one line of code. So you want to take that RGB image and turn it into grayscale. That's going to be um, uh, very simple to do. Then you can apply, say, a box filter blur on the image. So now the image is blurrier. You can apply a Gaussian blur on the image if that's what you want. And we also have um, something called image negative. So again, all this function, functionality has already been implemented. 
and you, the, the programmer, don't have to worry about optimizing the code from a, from a speed for, uh, perspective or from a correctness, correctness perspective. It's already been done for you. Now, um, just as a couple, another example, you want to use erosion. Well, all you really are going to have to do is um, create some sort of mask and then call a function using that mask. So once again, it's sort of a two-step kind of thing, but a lot of the work has been already implemented for you. You just have to supply the parameters. And so doing a lot of these operations is going to be straightforward. And again, we, just, uh, we can show you um, how easy it is to, um, to put, spit that out onto screen. Uh, if you want to use filters, well, you can do a 1D, a 2D, or 3D um, convolution filter. You can, um, you can decide that you want a separable convolution filter in which you use a column filter followed by a row filter on, the, on a given image. Maybe you want to use a 2D correlation filter. So there's a lot of different things that you can do, and functionality is already there for you. Uh, you can uh, just as easily get a histogram if that's what you need. and um, there's additional functionality. In this example over here, I've loaded um, an image on the left, um, this image over here. Um, we then uh, we resize the image by a factor of half. We take half the size of the image. We, we rotate it, and then we use a, a, an additional transformation. And then we uh, put that image over here on the right. But again, these are all simple and straightforward in, um, transformation that have been highly optimized. If what you want is image smoothing, we have bilateral uh, smoothing, mean shift, uh, median filter. You can do use a Gaussian kernel, a convolution. So all these, again, are implemented for you. Um, if you're using a rate fire, you can use um, a 2D FFT, uh, a 3D FFT. You can uh, do an FFT with padding. You can use um, uh, a convolution using an FFT. There's a lot of things you can do with it. Now, the um, the the amount of capabilities that's available in the Ray Fire is pretty, pretty darn big. Uh, we've designed it so you can get a lot of parallel functions for multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary work, whether it be image processing, machine learning, uh, graphics. If you're using, you're using doing set type of operations, um, and, and there's a lot more functionality I'll, I'll discuss in some of the um, upcoming slides. Now, ArrayFire is supported, uh, supported natively in C and C++. But we have language wrappers for Fortran, uh, for Java, and for R. Uh, you can use ArrayFire on Linux, Windows, or Mac OS. Um, some additional uh, capabilities that we have, it's an open GL-based graphics. That's the type of graphics we support. We have just-in-time uh, code generations which allows us to combine multiple operations into a single kernel and getting better performance. We've created a macro or data construct, construct that we call G4, which is a data parallel uh, loop, and which allows you to basically run concurrent execution, execution over multiple data sets. For example, I have a single kernel and I want to use it on multiple images. I can use this G4 for that and get better performance. And um, again, the types of functions that we support are reduction, scan, set operation, sorting, statistics, and basic matrix multiplication, and a whole lot more. These are just the building blocks that we support. Um, if you're interested in, in signal and image processing, we have convolutions, FFT, histograms, interpolations, um, connected components. Linear algebra, we have matrix multiplications, linear system solving, factorizations. Um, and a lot more of uh, highly optimized functions. So what's the G4 data construct? Well, it's a construct that we've created that allows you to run multiple kernels at the same time. So let's just, let's just say that I have this for loop here, that uh, for loop that I'm multiplying uh, three matrices A, AI times B. So I have A1 times B, A2 times B, and A3 times B. Well, if I was doing it in a, a single met matrix vector multiplication, I would first do A1 times B. When I'm done with that, I would do A2 times B. And when I'm done with that, I do A, A3 times B. Uh, G4 lets you actually, the G4 construct actually lets you run all three of these concurrently. And the benefit of that is you get better, better system utilization because it could very well be that the multiplication of A1 times uh, B is not going to utilize the entire system. But when you bring in additional data structure, uh, you can do additional operations, you can get better performance. 
Another benefit of it is the fact that um, A1 times B and A2 times B and A3 times B are all going to need B. And so you might also get a benefit of cash performance because you're going to fetch B exactly one time to the cash. And so you get the benefit of that as well. Um, another feature that we have is just-in-time code generation where um, while we're running the code, we can see if you're using a cer certain type of operations, we can find a way to integrate the, all the operation that you're doing into a single kernel. And um, what that allows us to do is allows us to reduce the number of kernels you're calling into a single kernel, which again reduces the number of, uh, reduces the overhead of calling kernels multiple times. It means that you don't have to allocate or use temporary um, data to store your uh, results. And the most important of these, or maybe not the most important, but just as important is it can improve the cache performance that you have because you're not kicking out information that you need. And so this actually gives you, um, um, will improve your speed ups. Um, we are in the future, we're very much interested in big data applications. And the type of, uh, the direction that we'd like to go to is we'd like to create capabilities for doing streaming videos. We'd like to be able to support larger, a larger number of images for more um, parallel processing. We'd like to support uh, more machine learning functionality. And uh, of course, that's going to come with data analysis. We'd like to support data, dynamic data and streaming data, such as um, uh, um, social network analysis. And um, um, with that, we also want to create uh, better graphics and faster rendering utilities for big data because it's not only important to analyze that we want to be able to put them on screen as fast as we possibly can. So those are sort of some of the directions we're looking at. Um, if you want to take a look at our open source community, go to um, github.com at arrayfire-community. And um, that's it for today, so it, we'd love to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Oded. Now we'll go to questions. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Okay, now Oded, our first question is from Nasser, and the question is, do you use any optimization of using local memory in the GPU? Um, hi, this is Omer from ArrayFire. Um, so, uh, de depends on the, depending on the algorithm, we we do use local memory. Uh, for example, convolution, we bring in um, a local window as well as the kernel into local memory, and then um, work on that. So, um, it really depends on the algorithm. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. For example, when you're doing uh, JIT type calculations, you don't really need that type of optimization. So you're only going to use the data once, so in that case we wouldn't. Uh, but uh, we use it wherever we can. Okay, thank you. Our next question from Saeed is, how does the array fire perform with OpenCV comparison for like object tracking with or without array fire? So, um, it, it really depends on the algorithm. Um, generally, we've seen about, uh, it depends on the algorithm as well as the card. So it, it, it's a very, um, it's a complicated, uh, I can't really give you a, it's not a, a number. It's straightforward comparison. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I would say most of the time it's like 5x if, I, if you were to force me to answer that question. Five times faster. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, our next question is from Kurt. And he says, do you see many jobs out there for someone with a strong life sciences background working on a PhD in genetics and who has experience writing simulation and optimization algorithms? So um, uh, this is Oded. I, absolutely, I think that um, um, the number of applications uh, out there available for the GPU are so great and it, they're so much greater than the number of um, um, GPU specialists that I, I truly believe that it is possible. And um, 
it, there is a learning curve to step in to learn how to use the GPU, but that's where we think that libraries such as ArrayFire are going to be useful for, um, for the non-specialists initially because they allow you to create a uh, fast GPU program, program without needing to understand everything perfectly. But at, at the end of the day, we think that um, uh, people that come from these different um, um, domains and disciplines are going to be very useful and key in creating better and new software packages, whether it be people from the social sciences that can help us create better uh, social network analytics, or people from life sciences that can help us create better, say, biological simulations. So I think it's really an important thing um, that um, people do step up to the plate, and we hope that our package will help them with that. Okay, thank you, Odin. Our next question is, what languages can you use ArrayFire with? Uh, so this is Omar from ArrayFire. Um, so we have, uh, we natively support C and C++, but we have many language wrappers. Uh, we have a Java uh, as well as Fortran and re more recently R. Uh, language wrappers and you can download those from our website and there are a couple of language wrappers in our community page as well but we don't officially support those. Uh, but uh, if you go to our GitHub page, uh, github.com slash arrayfire, you, you'll see all the language wrappers we offer for our library. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Suchi. And the question is, does the library support multiple GPUs? If it does, how does the library manage the execution across different GPUs? Um, this is Omer again. So we have um, a function called uh, device set, which allows you to um, set the context of the uh, subsequent um, function calls. So if you set, uh, by default, it device set zero, they'll use the first GPU on the, on the system. And then subsequent uh, function calls will target that GPU. And then once, uh, if you want to change the GPU, you can set, use the device set function again and set it to one or two or however many GPUs you have on the system. And um, then uh, the context changes to that next GPU. So using that construct, you can, uh, you can for example, put this in a for loop and uh, put device set on top and um, this will allow you to do calculations on a separate GPUs at the same time. So, But you'll have to manage the transfer of the memory and everything yourself. So there, there are ways of uh, doing this on multiple GPUs but uh, using our library. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Paul. The question is, as a relative newbie wanting to learn OpenCL and the basics of some of the libraries you've mentioned, are there good collections of examples and tutorials? If so, where might I find some of those? Um, so uh, you can go to our GitHub page and we, list, uh, we have a set of examples from uh, many disciplines, uh, including machine learning, computer vision, and uh, so you can use, uh, you can start um, analyzing those and um, get started. Also, OpenCV has many um, samples, and most of the libraries that we talked about have samples on uh, that come with the package. So um, there, there's lots of stuff out there. You just have to know where to look. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from Scott. The question is, are you considering WebCL? OpenCL plus JavaScript bindings if it becomes adopted by browser vendors, which granted is a big if. Um, so that's, uh, we, we're uh, still uh, looking into it. Uh, web is one of those places that we are interested in and uh, we have done some research on that end, but uh, it's, it's uh, Still an experimental plugin for most browsers, um, so we um, we have looked into it and we're considering all options. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is another question from Scott. How does your G 
JIT balance reducing batch count with, with preventing kernels from getting too large? Um, so uh, we've, we handle all that in the back end. It's, um, it's, it's uh, out of the scope of this talk, I think, but um, uh, there, there, are, there are a couple of tricks that we use on the back end to handle all that. So uh, you don't have to worry about kernels getting too large. Um, we, we take care of all that for you. Okay, we have a question from Thomas. Uh, he wants to know what are other resources to learn OpenCL? Um, other, uh, I don't understand that question. Is there, uh, can you ask him to elaborate? Okay, Thomas, if you want to add a follow-up question for us, uh, I'll, I'll ask that of the panel. And then while we're looking at that, um, we've got another question from Dirk. The question is, were the companies shown in the sheet success stories using OpenCL before using ArrayFire? So, so th that slide um, um, is basically we show how we came in as a company and we were able to uh, speed up their computations uh, using uh, optimization of using our own tools. It's not. This is not an academic comparison. Though we we ran the the high the best optimized uh, code on the CPU versus the, the GPU. We took their algorithms and compared them with our implementations, getting the same results. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Rohit, and the question is: Are there any utilities which can enumerate the capabilities of OpenCL-based devices? in PC, phones, and FPGA-based devices? Could you repeat that question? The question is, are there any utilities which can enumerate the capabilities of OpenCL-based devices in PC, phones, and FPGA-based devices? Um, I think there are a couple of utilities out there. Um, our library does list some features of the device you're using, but it doesn't list everything. Um, I can't think of the utility name off. Uh, there, there's a utility called CL Info. If you search for that online, you, you should be able to it'll list all the features of that device, uh, depending on what platform you're using. OK, thank you. Our next question is, can you run code on multiple GPUs using ArrayFire? Uh, yes. Uh, if you use the device set function, uh, it, it allows you to um, run code uh, on different GPUs and put the context to a different GPU and then um, run the code on that GPU. So uh, if you look at our API for the device set function, there's an example there. To do so. Okay, and uh, we've got. Looks like we've got one more question. What types of visualizations can be used with ArrayFire? Um, we currently support um, basic image. Uh, we display images. We have a line plot, histogram, um, surface, uh, 3D plot and uh, things like that. And scatter plots. And scatter plots. Um, uh, so um, if you go to our um, documentation, there should be a graphics portion and shows um, all the functions that we offer in ArrayFire to analyze the data. OK, thank you. And that ends our program for today. I wanted to remind everyone, if you Think of a question uh, that after the session ends, you can get in touch with ODED and his team at the information shown on your screen. And if you'd like to know about future webinars, you can follow us on Twitter at AMD Dev Central, or you can check out our website at developer.amd.com. And again, if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact ODED at ODED at ArrayFire.com. And again, I'd like to thank you for attending today, and thank you, Oded.
and team for a great webinar. And have a wonderful afternoon.